Good afternoon, Hi, all. <laughs> Oops, got a little too too excited there. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our regularly programmed artist uh, COVID nineteen call. We are the mayor's office of arts and culture, and we've been having these calls. Um, over the past several months in Boston to bring together artists around issues that affect them related to COVID-19 and kind of how to move forward and how to take best care of themselves during this time. And we've been bringing guest speakers together throughout this time to share information and allow artists to meet each other and ask questions. Um, so thank you all for being here today. Next slide, please, Pascal. So um, my name is Julia Ryan. I'm the artist resource manager for the city of Boston. And I usually start off these meetings with just a few updates about coronavirus. So as of July 28th, we have almost 14,000 confirmed cases in Boston. Of those, about 10,000 have recovered and 727 have died. We've been noticing over the past few weeks that positive test rates have been going down um, week by week, which is really great. And everyone should know that we're still doing COVID-19 testing throughout the city. So there are lots of sites. We have a map on our website and testing is covered by insurance. Um, if that's not an option for you, a lot of the sites actually will just test folks for free as well. So we really hope you'll check out that resource. Um, we also wanted to let you all know quickly that one of our grants um, from the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture that we've been running every year for the past four years, the Opportunity Fund has actually just reopened with our new fiscal year. So this is a grant for local artists to either support um, ways of developing your career or ways of sharing your work with the public. Now, obviously sharing your work with the public these days looks a little different than it used to. So we are welcoming um, virtual events. We are welcoming virtual workshops, classes, um, concerts, ways that you, you know you best can share your work, whether it's through performing or teaching your particular artistic discipline. So we really hope that you'll consider applying to that. Um, again, I said you could also use this for career development. So that's really self-defined. You're welcome to apply to the grant to use it for um, perhaps attending a professional development opportunity, buying equipment, or even paying for rent of your studio space. So Check it out on our website. There's more information there and we'll have it open on a rolling basis for now. Um, last but not least, we have set up an arts and culture fund that's for organizations to help with recovering throughout this time. And the deadline for that is coming up at the end of July. So one thing to note is that you do need a vendor ID. That's something um, that the city uses an ID basically to help um, pay you through our pay payment system. So, that's not too hard. It usually takes about a day to get one. Um, you just have to do that through our website before submitting your application. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I would love to introduce some of our guest speakers today. Today, we are focusing on the 2020 census. We're focusing on ways artists can get involved and why it's important. And I'm really, really excited to um, introduce to you my colleague, Audrey. Audrey is an amazing theater practitioner. Um, Audrey is also the community engagement director at um, Front Porch Arts Collective. And she's gonna kick us off today with introducing some of our other speakers and also just more information about the census and how you can get involved this year. Awesome, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Julia and Pascal for having us. Um, I would first actually like to uh, kick it over to our pals at Mass Creative, who, as you all know, are the, uh, the, the people when it comes to arts and politics. And I think the census is at a really um, fantastic intersection of those two in, in ways you may not expect. Um, so it's actually, uh, they're doing some census advocacy as part of their Create the Vote campaign. Um, so I'll throw it over to uh, Executive Director Emily Ruddick and uh, Simone Lewis, from, also from Mass Creative. Thanks, Audrey. Hello, all. Um, yes, we are delighted to live at the intersection between policy and arts and culture um, as one of a couple of statewide arts and cultural advocacy organizations. And, you know, we spent a lot of time thinking about how we how we would engage in the 2020 elections um, cycle and um, thinking about the role that the creative community plays in taking in building community cohesion and taking care of our communities. We do it every time we invite patrons into our theater spaces, every time we engage and, and do community art projects in a neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> and so 
the Create the Vote campaign was really devised as a campaign and an opportunity for the arts and cultural community to play our role as leaders in civic um, engagement and to strengthen democracy. And so I'm going to turn it over to Simone, who's going to talk a little bit more about Create the Vote and why we're talking about Create the Vote when we're talking about the census. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'm Simone. I'm a fellow with Mass Creative this summer working on Create the Vote, um, which, as Emily kind of explained, is our nonpartisan public education campaign around civic engagement. Um, it's something that Mass Creative has done in the past, but this year, this 2020 iteration is really different, um, just in the ways that we need to respond to what's going on in the world around us and what's different this year. So um, this year, we're working with a steering committee of some really amazing arts and culture organizations and then also some democracy organizations like Mass Vote. Uh, so it's not just us, we're hearing lots of different voices going in lots of different directions. So it's really a coalition based campaign. Um, our goals for 2020, so to increase civic engagement and strengthen democracy, both within the creative community and also with a focus on underrepresented communities in democracy. So this is including but certainly not limited to um, BIPOC communities, queer and trans youth, youth across the board, immigrant communities, um, and unfortunately others that are underrepresented in democracy. Um, another goal is increasing voter participation in the 2020 election specifically um, through education, registration, and turnout efforts. So we're really trying to streamline and then disseminate information about how to vote this year and how to vote safely. And then a third goal is increasing representative democracy through participation in the census, which we've really been focusing on this month specifically, and Audrey is going to talk about in a lot more depth. And then lastly, the goal is just positioning the creative community as a leader in civic engagement. Um, and as they already are a leader in Boston and a leader in Massachusetts, so we're asking and encouraging people to sign on to our pledge to create the vote, um, which the link is on the slide or you can find it at the Mass Creative website. Um, and signing on to the pledge just means that we'll be sending along information throughout the campaign action items and anyone can participate in whatever capacity they have to offer and whatever ways that they most want to participate in our campaign. So we're really excited about that and I'll pass it over to Audrey to really delve into the census. Awesome. Thank you so much, Emily and Simone. That was great. Um, could you move to the next slide, please, Pascal? Okay, cool. Um, so my little disclaimer up at the top here is that um, I'm absolutely a lay person. I am a person who did not know what the census was probably about 18 months ago, um, and then have just gotten really involved in it. You will later hear from the incredible Sebastian Zapata, who is a senior analyst and uh, the liaison for the city of Boston, and this is his job. This is not a this is, it, well, I'll get into it later. It's kind of become my job, but uh, overall, this is just something I'm really passionate about and nerdy about personally. Um, so it's kind of a census for dummies crash course. Uh, so first of all, what is the census? Uh, the census is pretty much just a head count of every single person living in the United States, regardless of age, demographic, citizenship. Just if you're living here on April the 1st, 2020, you're being counted in the census. That's what it's trying to do. Uh, it's actually mandated in our constitution. This differs from the annual census that your city does, or city or town does every year, um, because this is a national effort. Um, and so it's been happening every decade, basically on the decade since 1790. Um, so there's, you know, a lot of conversations now around personal data. And so people, you know, you're at, you're filling out 10 semi-personal questions. So you might be wondering what they use that data for. Um, it actually uh, is really important, not only for population counts, as I mentioned, but for determining where a lot of our federal funding goes to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, this impacts healthcare, education, infrastructure, um, and of course, the arts. Uh, and this also, um, you know, you can see sort of the official statement here from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, but essentially, it also determines your uh, democratic representation. So um, redistricting happens every 10 years with information from the census. They will redraw some of those uh, district lines, which will impact uh, not only your state legislatures, but also representation in the U.S. House of Representatives in Congress. So as you can imagine, it would be very important to have an accurate count of people since representation in that body is based on population size of each state. So. 
Um, the other reason that this is really important this year is not that your you know, annual uh, city censuses are unimportant. This is really important because it only happens once every 10 years. So the data that we get, they use it for the next 10 years. So it's important that we you know, get it right. Next slide, please. Why is this a political issue? Um, well, you might have kind of guessed from money and representation that this is really tied to you know, American democracy. Uh, in ways you may not have known before. Um, and so the the trouble with uh, the census is that there are a lot of um, historically undercounted um, bodies that are, are that are more vulnerable um, and disproportionately impacted by the results and the data drawn from the census. So um, particularly people of color are disproportionately impacted. And then there's um, this list of groups for folks who are undercounted. Uh, particularly low income households, renters, people who move around a lot, uh, young children, zero to four, and that, you know, this is going to determine some of our early education uh, funding, immigrant communities, which we'll get into why, particularly this year, it's been really difficult to get immigrants to fill out the census, um, households where English is not the predominant language. Uh, obviously, your, the first mailing is in English, and that can be, you know, very easily thrown away by someone who doesn't read the language. Um, and then those, finally, those living in group quarters, which we'll also talk about why that's a big deal in Boston, because that includes people living in dorms, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, you know, people who are either living in, living in a large group home or not, or not at that residence all year long. And this year, maybe you weren't there when they were supposed to be. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So why is census 2020 the hardest census ever? There's a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is that uh, this is actually the first year it's um, going virtual and going online. In 2010, we used paper forms. So this is the first year that there's a census website and most people are going to be filling out online as opposed to on paper or over the phone, which were methods you could use in the past. Um, so a lot of, you know, trial and error there. Um, being done by our Census Bureau. Uh, distrust of the federal government, I would say, is at an all-time high in many vulnerable populations. Um, so particularly, you know, as we kind of mentioned, those undercounted groups that need the resources um, are, you know, seeing a lot of hateful rhetoric coming from our, uh, from our federal government. We're seeing, you know, there is uh, rhetoric around potential of creating a Muslim registry. There have been ICE raids. Um, and really the biggest one here was that uh, President Trump really wanted there to be a citizenship question on the census that was actually struck down. It is not one of the 10 questions being asked, but um, if you don't stay up, this is, you know, I'll talk a little bit about how also it's an election year, so there's like a lot going on um, in the media and whatnot, so those things aren't being reported on um, or talked about as much, so it's important to know. No citizenship question, but that's already created distrust and unrest in immigrant communities, obviously. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the election year, political activists' resources and media attention are super divided. Um, and there's a lot more like kind of excitement and like sexiness around a presidential election that isn't so much around a federal census. Um, but this actually could have an even longer impact than casting your vote because it's for 10 years, not just for four. Um, and then of course, uh, COVID-19, obviously it's impacted everything, um, but it's absolutely uh, delayed the timeline and, and um, forcing folks who had traditional advocacy strategies of building resource centers and going door to door, a lot of that has to change because um, the health precautions that we have to take. So you might be wondering how Boston and Massachusetts are doing. And the answer is good, not great. Sebastian will get into this more specifically for the city of Boston. Um, Massachusetts as a whole, as of right now, is several points ahead of the nation on response rate thus far. The self-response rate um, for Massachusetts is that 64.6% of households have already responded to the census, which is great. Um, in at the end of uh, 2010, it was 68.8 for the entire. So we're like getting close to where we were last time, but still, you know, several points behind. Um, but Boston actually is the ninth hardest to count major city in America, most like, mostly due to immigrants, uh, immigrant communities and student populations. So as I kind of mentioned, those group quarters, people live in dorms, they move out, their parents count them or don't count them, and then they don't fill out their census because they live in a dorm. Um, so uh, there's a 64% self-response goal this year, but we're currently only at 53%. That's why it's Census Advocacy Week, which Sebastian also will talk about later on. Um, and if you're a super nerd, I've put the link here for Census Tracker so you can see how your community is doing. Um, it's like three days behind the official count I hear, but it's the most up-to-date like civilian resource 
uh, for seeing how, you know, you can go by state, county, city, town, um, you get pretty in depth. So you can see how your community is doing. Next slide, please. Timeline, what are we working with? What can we do now? Um, so there's been a huge shift and extension on the timeline for the census, which is a good thing. Um, but the dates that were presented in early advocacy, uh, Mass Creative and Arts Boston, I worked there with a uh, presentation pre-COVID times with lots of dates and advocacy in February. And a lot of those dates are no longer accurate um, if you attended that. Um, but this is overall a good thing because we need more time to uh, collect accurate data. So the self-response phase was supposed to be ending this week, but is now actually staying open until October 31st. This is where we get the best quality data because, you know, as we talk about with identity and stuff, it's best to self-identify and self-fill out that form. Um, so you should encourage your friends to self-respond and self-respond if you haven't already. Um, census offices are actually reopened already and working now, and they're currently focusing on group quarters, uh, which were previously inaccessible due to quarantine. Um, soon we'll be moving into non-response follow-up, which is, you know, where you might have seen videos of census workers going door to door, knocking, asking questions. It's kind of similar to canvassing. They use a similar app. Um, and so that period is going to take place August 11th to October 31st. Um, sometime in September, they will be doing, you know, transitory populations, trailer parks, um, homeless folks. Um, if you've participated in the homeless census with, uh, in, in Boston, that's essentially the same thing, but a three-day nationwide effort. Um, and the biggest change, I think, actually here is the presentation of the data, which will happen in at the end of April 2021. Previously, it was due at the end of December 2020. So going back to create the vote and elections and, you know, nonpartisan voting and things, there is a great, there is a chance that if, you know, depending on who you're stumping for, uh, we might have a different president that is presented with and chooses, you know, chooses to analyze uh, that data. So that's something that is completely different now because of COVID. Um, next slide, please. Great. Uh, so this is actually um, some slides about how to fill out the census. Um, it's uh, Sebastian uh, put these awesome photos of exactly what the website looks like, where you click, um, you know, if you have a questionnaire, everyone was mailed a questionnaire in March. Um, but obviously, it's been many months. So if you don't have that, you know, letter anymore, there's still ways to fill out the census. Um, I didn't know if there was anything you wanted to add in here, uh, Sebastian, re filling out the census. Yeah, um, just just real quick. So again, uh, for a lot of people, they're going to be asked to put in their 12 digit census ID, which you technically do not need to respond to the census. It's just that unfortunately, once people go online to try to respond, they're hit with that question that are, oh, man, I misplaced that or I lost or I recycled it because it was so many months ago that I received it. So they kind of stare at that page and go, huh. All right. Well, I tried and they don't actually complete their census. So that's why we want to just highlight for people, you know, again, it's really just a two click process. You hit start questionnaire and then you say, if I don't have my census ID, you click the link that says, if you do not have your census ID, click here. So that's all you have to do. You input your address from there and you start filling out the census form as if you were to have that ID. But again, you technically don't need it to respond either online or over the phone. And the nice thing about responding either online or over the phone is that you can do it in 13 different languages. Um, so right now you only see the interface, but if you go to the next slide, you'll see all the 13 different languages that you can actually respond to the census in, as well as the hotlines associated with each language line. So if you wanna call in one of these lines and respond that way, for example, if you're a non-native English speaker, you can call in in 12 languages that are not English. Um, but if you wanted to do it online, you can also do it in one of these 13 languages. There's a globe icon near the top right of the web page that you just click on and you click on whatever language it is that it's available in one of these 13. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so I didn't know that about all the different languages being in different languages on the website. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, as you can see, federal and state governments doing a lot to try to uh, get an accurate count. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Pascal? Awesome. So how can I help as an artist? Uh, number one would be fill out the census. We just went over that. Uh, it's, you know, very easy. It takes about 10 minutes. It's 10 questions. Um, and once you fill it out, you'll be like, wow, that was so easy. And then you can tell other people about how 
incredibly easy and awesome it is to fill out the census. Uh, there's You can be what, uh, what the census advocates call a trusted messenger for your community. These are people you know that you know that are in your social circles. They're going to respond more to what you're saying versus um, somebody off the street or someone from the government calling saying, hey, fill out your census. Um, so just remember to meet people where they at, can, you can connect their interests to the census pretty easily. If they care about health care, if they care about roads, if they care about the arts, all these things need require federal funding. Um, so, you know, tell them that their participation in the census, make sure it's that uh, equitable funding is given in all those different areas. And, and just remember, you know, as I mentioned, straightforward, easy, and super confidential. You can go to pr federal prison for 10 years for re revealing census data. It's very, very serious, protecting the Constitution. So even though it might feel kind of strange to tell the federal government where you live, who lives with you, what your gender is, um, it's important to know that uh, that information is confidential and cannot be breached for something like 63 years or something like that. Um, create, oh, you can also create art for the census. So this is a resource, um, Mass Creative Friends, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about it, uh, since it's specifically, uh, it's called Creatives for the Count. The website link is there. Yeah. This is some art. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Audrey. Um, I, and Sebastian, Full confession, I went on the link to fill out my census and was like, oh, I don't know what my digit code is. And then I clicked the link and very quickly filled out the census for my household. So I am um, I am a testament to that it can be done. Um, you know, I think, I think the thing I wanted to just mention here is that um, artists play an important role in lifting up the issues that matter most in our society. And I, we've seen that really clearly across the nation and then specifically in Boston in the last several months around the issues of racial injustice. And um, there's beautiful moving art and I would argue that some of the most compelling advocacy happens through art. Uh, and this is no different. This is a political issue. Um, and it is one where all of our voices matter and um, if you are thinking about how to engage in work that will make a difference in your community, this is one of the ways to think about doing that. So um, a group called Creatives for the Count created this website. In it, you will find a delightful tool toolbox about how if you want to host host a census creation party, you can. There's also um, they have a showcase and the image that you're seeing right here is from their website of work that artists have created um, a lot of social media digital work created to promote the census and encourage um, others to take the census and so we wanted to point you to that direction amazing and there's even more ways you can help too on the next slide um so if you are anything like me and a lot of our arts community, unfortunately, it's a really tough time for the arts. Uh, you might be furloughed, you might be unemployed, you can actually become a census worker. So uh, that might sound kind of anxiety inducing because according to our door and things, but it's 100% safe. Um, they have extensive PPE for their uh, workers and a lot of training and work with the census has moved um, to telework and remote work whenever possible. It's pretty lucrative, I would say, for an artist making 25 to 27.50 an hour in Suffolk County. Um, you can actually find your area's rate by county on the census website. It's linked there. Um, it's pretty fast, easy employment. I know this because I'm going to be an enumerator. Um, and I was told on, uh, I was told that I was in, in late June that I would be laid off from my full-time position. And before I even got my severance check, I had already applied, interviewed, and secured an enumeration position, probably in about 72 hours. So they really are looking for people um it's the application for, i don't even think i submitted a resume um and so they're looking to hire now i'll be attending my training on friday so if that's something you know you're interested in please follow up with me i'll let you know how it's going um pretty exciting i guess i had to go get fingerprinted but that's really the only in-person thing i've done so far and i'll do this social distance training with like three people um so really safe they're really taking social distancing super seriously over there um, yeah, and it's uh, just a really good temp gig. As I said, non-response follow-up is through October 31st. So um, a chance you have about a chance of, for eight weeks of work and you can work anywhere from 20 to 40 hours a week, give or take. Um, and also you can, if, if that's not your style, you can also volunteer. Um, so Mass Counts, uh, which is a, our, our state census advocacy agency group, if you will, uh, has um, Tuesdays and Thursdays phone banking. You see the dates and times there. Um, and you can also volunteer with the city of Boston. So I'll officially turn it over uh, to Sebastian because he is the expert 
it's Boston's campaign week for the census um, and our liaison. So yeah, let us know how we can volunteer. Uh, thanks, Audrey. Thanks, Julie, for having me on. Thanks for everyone that's on this call today. Um, so my name is Sebastian Zapata. I'm charged with overseeing all of our operations around trying to get the most accurate and inclusive count possible regarding the US 2020 census. Um, and so I know Audrey just went over a lot of amazing details. So thanks for doing that and having to, you know, me, I get to save some breath for once, which is nice. So I appreciate that. Um, but I really just do want to reiterate a lot of what she pointed out in terms around how important the census is for the next 10 years. Um, and so an example I always used to, to give to people is, for example, if you are a parent and you have a child, and let's say that child is three years old and they're not counted on the census, essentially they're losing out on federal resources for their childhood. Because by the time the next census comes, they're gonna be 13 and they're gonna be a teenager. And so in terms of when you think about what stems from the census count, it's a really a lot of what people are calling for today. So the, use the, the data collected by the Census Bureau is used to form new districts. So it's gonna reflect who gets counted. So when we're talking about how do we actually change historically disenfranchised and gerrymandered districts, it starts with having census data. So that's creating districts that again, reflect the people that actually live there. When you're talking about having representation down in DC, that's based off of the census population count. So back in 2010 and in 2000, in 1990, Massachusetts lost a seat in Congress each time, and therefore not only did we lose representation in Congress, but we also lost our impact in the Electoral College. And as I'm sure you might know, in November is going to be a big election. And I think even speaking on that aspect, not everybody can vote come November, whether because they might be a returning citizen or because they're not actually authorized to vote in the country for whatever reason that is. But everybody can and should participate in the census. The US Constitution very clearly states in the 14th Amendment that everyone, and that means all people, regardless of any status, whether that's immigration, age, able-bodiedness, socioeconomic, you name it, you count in the census, and therefore you should be counted. And the last thing again is around federal funding. So as I mentioned with that sort of the three-year-old example uh, of the parent and child, so the census uh, actually helps a lot with critical services and programming that a lot of our vulnerable populations depend on. So if you care about programs like Section 8 housing vouchers, community development block grants, free school lunches and breakfast in Boston public schools, if you care about education grants for public schools, if you care about Medicaid, Medicare, if you care about Head Start, all that stuff is funded through our census count. And I think in particular right now, because of COVID-19 absolutely decimating not only municipal and state budgets, we're really going to depend on an accurate census count so that we can continue to get federal funding to do recovery and relief efforts. Again, if you're, if you're in tune as to what's going on in Massachusetts, we're trying to fill a six to $8 billion budget gap. Uh, the city of Boston, fortunately, was able to find 60 to $80 million budget gap. But nonetheless, that's not gonna be sustainable long-term. We're gonna need as much federal assistance as possible. And so to ensure that we not only get our fair share of representation, uh, another way to help out in terms of making sure we get our fair share of federal funding is to fill out the census. And so at the City Hall, uh, we've been charged with trying to think about how do we pivot from doing engagement strategies that we had planned to really try to meet people where they're at, sort of that one-on-one -on -one interaction, going to community centers, going to large community events, going to neighborhood association meetings. Although all of that has sort of now, fortunately, you know, a little bit more adjusted to Zoom meetings and whatnot, a lot of people still might not have that, the best ability to do it via Zoom, and they really just need someone to talk them through it. And so what we've been doing is very similar to mass counts is trying to do phone banking as much as possible. Uh, and in particular, our, our, we've been looking at it through an equity perspective. So even though 53% of city of, of city of Boston has responded, we're seeing large disparities across that. So for example, in an area like West Roxbury or JP, which tend to skew older white homeowner, higher educational attainment, higher socio socioeconomic status, they're doing really well when it comes to responding to the census. And in fact, some parts of those census tracts, they've actually surpassed what they did 10 years ago, and they're in their 70 percent uh, of response rate. But you contrast that with areas that have more higher shares of immigrants, people of color, lower educational or socioeconomic attainment, and they're in the 30s, 40s, 50 percent. And so we're really trying to call through areas in Roxbury, Dorchester, East Boston. So if you want to help out two hours a day, an hour a day, whatever it is that you can give, please do reach out to me and I'm happy to plug you in. We'll provide any training. Um, and I know that Audrey herself is gonna be out there going door knocking and that's gonna be starting August 11th. So I really wanna enforce the people that for whatever reason that is that you don't wanna get a door knock come August 11th from the Census Bureau, 
It might be because you're in a mixed status household and for some reason you're afraid that there's technically a federal employee knocking on your door, even though it has nothing to do with Homeland Security, it has nothing to do with ICE. The best way to avoid that is to fill out your census either online or over the phone. If you don't want someone knocking on your door because you're still afraid of public health concerns because COVID-19 is still very much a real thing, the best way to avoid that door knock is fill out your census form either online or over the phone. If you don't want a door knock because you want to pause Netflix, fill out your census form online or over the phone. And so even though August 11th is a date that I'm really trying to push people to respond by, the last day again is October 31st. So even though we're at 53% and we're about 11 points away from what we did 10 years ago, there's still time to try to turn that curve around and buck the trend essentially. And so that's why we really try to form as many partnerships as possible and try to use these trusted messengers, as Aubrey had mentioned, to reinforce to people why it's safe Again, that's Title 13, which is a law that says that your information cannot be shared until 72 years have passed. Your personal information will never be shared with your landlord, ICE, Homeland Security, the mayor, the president. No one will see your individual responses until 72 years have passed. At the end of the day, all that data that's collected is, again, just used for statistical analysis to create redistricting, create reapportionment, and to create federal funding avenues. And so if you care about any of those things, and you're looking for something to do that's an immediate impact, all you have to do is fill out your census. It's 10 questions and 10 minutes to shape the next 10 years of our communities. I think there's one more slide, but that pretty much covers it. Yes, oh, that brings me to our, our, our last slide that I have. It's just really, this whole week has been a big census week of action. Uh, in particular, today was a big day of action uh, at City Hall. So we've created an outreach toolkit to just, again, try to reinforce to people, you might not have exactly all the, the expertise, but that's okay, you don't have to. You're gonna find within that toolkit a lot of good messaging, some sample social media texting graphics, some flyers and PSA videos um, to really just amplify the fact of how it is that you wanna participate and why it is that you should participate in the census. Um, because at the end of the day, again, like you count, be represented, be protected, uh, be counted. Um, and so that's sort of just a screenshot I took from one of the flyers we have on that toolkit, but it really speaks volumes to what I've been saying so far and what Audrey had already mentioned before. Great, Sebastian, thank you so much. Audrey, thank you so much. Emily, everyone, we really, really appreciate all of you coming. Simone, um, to talk today and just to kind of, you know, give us more information about how artists can really get involved right now um, in little and, you know, bigger ways. Um, and I'm just really excited to learn all this information today. And um, incredibly, it looks like we don't even have any questions. Uh, people are just really excited about the census and getting involved. So I think with that, Thank you all so much for joining us and um, we hope you'll stay in touch on our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter at Arts in Boston and sign up for our newsletters where you can hear about upcoming plans for our next um, artist, individual artist and creative worker calls. And Pascal, was there anything else you wanted to mention before we close up for today? Uh, I think the only thing I wanted to remind everyone is that we will not be having a meeting this Friday for the Arts and Cultural Institution COVID-19 meeting. We'll have our next meeting August 7th. So take a break this weekend, enjoy. And if anyone has any other questions, feel free to email me or Julian will be happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much. All right, everyone have a great evening and we will see you next time.